Let's continue our journey with the lymphatic system and immunity. Part 2A involves a discussion of innate immunity. Immunity is the ability to resist infection and disease. We divide this into two major types or categories. We have the nonspecific defense system, also referred to as innate immunity, and the specific defense system, also referred to as adaptive immunity. So what I've done is divided these into our line of defenses. Our first line of defense, second line of defense, and third line of defense. So let's first look at our first line of defense. Bottom line, they are meant to prevent entry of the microbe or pathogen. So for nonspecific barrier, physical barriers, the ultimate will be our skin, the epidermis of our skin. We also have nasal hair, which is meant to filter out microbes and particulates. Cilia, along with mucus, will help move and trap microbes and particulates that we inhale. The mucous membrane, which lines the respiratory, digestive, and urinary tracts, contain mucus. Resonant bacteria and normal flora that inhabit the body. So what we have is a competition between these bacteria. Because we only have so many available nutrients and space. Therefore, they keep each other in check. Furthermore, it prevents pathogens from gaining a foothold. Chemical barriers, such as sebum and sweat, are part of the acidic mantle of our skin. This will limit the growth of certain microbes. Lysozyme is a small enzyme that breaks down the cell wall of bacteria. We find this in saliva, nasal secretions, tears, sweat, and they also contain IgA. IgA is antibody A or immunoglobulin A. Our tears, which are meant to keep our eyeballs clean and lubricated, will also contain lysozyme and IgA. Now, when something enters our eye, tear production increases. So what does that do? Well, that helps flush out whatever has made contact with the surface of our eye. The stomach and vagina are acidic. So this will prevent the growth of certain microorganisms and will also keep the existing microorganisms at bay. Urine. When we urinate, that flushes out our urinary tract. Mucin, which is produced by those goblet cells. When mucin combines with water, we produce mucus, which is quite sticky. So it acts like flypaper, meant to trap microorganisms. Our saliva, salivary glands are continuously producing saliva. So that helps clean and lubricate our mouth. In addition, they contain lysozyme and IgA. So if we quickly look at the various bodily fluids, we have a number of them that contains lysozyme and IgA. We have saliva, the nasal secretions like mucus, tears, and sweat. Let's now look at our second line of defense. We have the nonspecific cellular, the phagocytes that are meant to engulf pathogens whole. We have the monocytes, the macrophages, the neutrophils, and the eosinophils. Natural killer cells, also called NK cells, that's part of our immune surveillance. These NK cells is a type of lymphocyte. Now, let's look at the nonspecific chemical and protein defenses. Inflammation is meant to limit the spread of infections. So we'll see how basophils and mast cells are involved in the inflammatory response. We have protective antimicrobial proteins, interferon, complement, and defensins. Defensins are defense proteins that provide a chemical barrier. They directly attack microorganisms, including viruses. They support immune cell functions and will promote wound healing. The last type of non-chemical and protein defenses is fever. By increasing our body temperature, this will accelerate metabolic activity as well as our immunity. 
Let's focus on adaptive immunity, specific defense system. So we have humoral immunity and cellular immunity. The B lymphocyte is involved, then that's referred to as humoral immunity or antibody-mediated immunity. If the T lymphocytes are involved, then we call that cellular immunity or cellular-mediated immunity. Together, this is our third line of defense, which I like to refer to as the heavy guns. So what I've done is I've created this chart that breaks down the different components of innate immunity, nonspecific barrier, nonspecific cellular, and nonspecific chemical and protein defenses. And beneath that is our adaptive immunity, our third line of defense. Humoral immunity, which involves the B cells, and cellular immunity, which involves the T cells. I really like this image because it's showing us the first line of defense. In fact, there are a few here which I did not include when we talked about the nonspecific barriers. Quickly scanning the image, we have our hairs, nasal secretions, of course, that contain lysozymes, IgA. They also will contain defensins, something we'll talk about later. The process of coughing and sneezing will help eliminate microbes. Vomiting, as well as defecation, eliminates microbes. The fact that our stomach has a very low pH because of hydrochloric acid secretions will destroy most microbes, including the toxins they produce. Urination will also flush out our urinary tract, our skin, which is the ultimate physical barrier, and as well as the mucous membranes that contain a thin layer of mucus, a very sticky mucus that helps trap microbes. And just as we talked about already, they will contain lysozymes and IgA. Cilia will help sweep things along. And of course, we can't forget the oily secretion and as well as this wet gland secretion that's part of our chemical barrier. And here we have the lacrimal gland and saliva, which contains again lysozyme along with IgA or antibody A. So look over this diagram because again, it's a nice summary of our first line of defense the nonspecific barrier. So this image shows us the second line of defense, both nonspecific cellular and nonspecific chemical and protein defenses. So once again, we'll quickly go over this slide. We can see our macrophages, these phagocytes, nonspecific cellular. We also have the basophils and mast cells that are part of our inflammatory response. Our natural killer cells, part of our nonspecific cellular defense. Another phagocytic cell is the eosinophil that's involved in parasitic worm infections. And we have the interferons, which are the nonspecific chemical and protein defenses. And down here, we have complement. So our nonspecific immunity or innate immunity will be discussed in this presentation. So what I've done is redrawn the chart showing us the components of innate immunity. And as we go through these different components, I will circle the part that we are discussing. So we are now looking at nonspecific cellular, specifically the phagocyte. So phagocytes are leukocytes or white blood cells that consume foreign microbes or pathogen through the process of phagocytosis. We have our granular sites that have visible cytoplasmic granules that are phagocytic. We have our neutrophils and we have our eosinophils. Neutrophils are the most abundant phagocytes and are the most abundant leukocytes that we have. However, after they've consumed a number of microbes, they will eventually die. Neutrophils love to consume bacteria, so they consume bacteria whole, and eventually, once they've consumed enough bacteria, they will eventually die. Another type of granulocyte are the eosinophils. These are phagocytic cells. In fact, their specialty is parasitic worms. So this image shows us 
what eosinophils will do. So they are parasite destroying cells and again, parasitic worms. So they release cytotoxic chemicals that will eventually destroy or hopefully will destroy the parasitic worm. However, they are not fail proof because there are still some parasitic worms that despite the best effort of eosinophils, they are unable to neutralize them. Another type of phagocyte are the macrophages, the largest of our leukocytes. They develop from monocytes. Monocytes, if you recall, are found in blood. When monocytes leave blood, they then become macrophages. So macrophages are found among our tissue cells, are found in interstitial fluid, and are also found in lymphatic tissue. These macrophages are the primary and most robust phagocytic cell that we have. They can either stay put, if they do, they're called fixed macrophages. In other words, they don't leave the organ in which they're located in. A good example is microglia in our central nervous system and the alveolar macrophage, commonly known as the dust cells, located in our lungs. We also have macrophages that are free or wandering, meaning they move around tissue spaces, the interstitial fluid, for example, that surrounds our cells. They enter lymphatic capillaries and eventually making their way into lymph nodes, for example. So they literally wander. I want to talk about macrophages in the context of being called antigen-presenting cells. If you remember, we talked about antigen-presenting cells in part one. Antigen-presenting cells will phagocytose the pathogen, as I've illustrated down over here, and process a little bit of that pathogen that we're going to call a process antigen and displays it on what's called the major histocompatibility complex, MHC. So in order, once again, to be classified as an antigen-presenting cell, this must be done. Now, is this the primary function of a macrophage to be an antigen-presenting cell? No. Their primary function is to phagocytose. So I like to refer to macrophages as the professional phagocytes. So as they're wandering around and they find something that shouldn't be there, they will consume them whole. It just so happens that they are also antigen-presenting cells. But I want to emphasize again that that is not their primary goal, to function as an antigen-presenting cell. We'll talk about another APC called the dendritic cell in which that is their primary role or function. So more to come later. Let's talk about the process of phagocytosis. And the process begins when the phagocyte recognizes and adheres to the pathogen's carbohydrate signature. Here we have the pathogen. Let's assume that the pathogen is bacteria. Will endocytose or phagocytose the bacteria. And in doing so, it will form a phagocytic vesicle called a phagosome. And here we have a lysosome, an organelle, that contains digestive enzymes. So the idea is to break down this phagosome. So the lysosome and the phagosome will fuse, and now these digestive enzymes will break down the bacteria. And some of the debris will be removed through exocytosis, such as indigestible and residual material. Now, if it is an antigen-presenting cell, it will take this one step further by processing some of that digested pathogen, which will then be expressed or displayed on an MHC protein, major histocompatibility complex. So here is this process antigen, which represents a little bit or a piece of this bacteria or any given pathogen that this phagocyte phagocytosed. Turning to this image over here, we can see the macrophage, the most robust and the primary phagocyte that we have, will have these cytoplasmic extensions called pseudopods. And these pseudopods 
will cling to that bacteria, making it easier for this macrophage to engulf the bacteria or pathogen. Now, some microorganisms will have external capsules that will hide this carbohydrate signature, helping them to evade phagocytosis. There is a process called opsonization. This is where our immune system will use antibodies or complement proteins as opsonin. So what are opsonins? What they do is they will coat the pathogen, the exterior part of the pathogen, basically acting as handles, which will make it easier for the phagocyte to grab onto, therefore enhancing phagocytosis. And in fact, will make phagocytosis more likely to occur. So what are some of these opsonins? We have two antibodies that function as opsonins, IgG and IgM. IgG is immunoglobulin G, or antibody G. IgM, immunoglobulin M, or antibody M. So what I try to do is illustrate these antibodies functioning as opsonins. Remember, they'll coat the exterior part of this pathogen, making it easier for phagocytosis to occur. So once again, these two antibodies, IgG and IgM, act as opsonins. Another opsonin is complement protein C3B. So C3B, just like these antibodies, will attach itself to this pathogen, the exterior part of the pathogen, increasing the likelihood that these phagocytes will grab onto this pathogen and phagocytose it. Here is another image showing us the antigen presenting cell that has phagocytosed the pathogen, forming a phagosome. Here is the lysosome that contains those digestive enzymes. They fuse together. So now we have a phagolysosome, and now degradation or breakdown of that pathogen begins. Any part of that pathogen that is not going to be used by the cell will be exocytosed. Now, if this were an antigen-presenting cell, which in fact this image represents, then that antigen will be processed and displayed on an MHC protein. And here is that processed antigen, which we can also refer to as an epitope. So let's look at these antigen-presenting cells once again. So we've discussed the macrophage in terms of being a professional phagocyte in that this is their primary role, is to remove as many of these pathogens as possible. It just so happens that it'll process a little bit of that pathogen and display it on an MHC. This is what makes the macrophage an antigen-presenting cell an APC. Another example of an antigen-presenting cell that I briefly mentioned in the last slide is the dendritic cell. I like to refer to them as professional antigen-presenting cells because that is their primary function. They'll engulf, they'll take in that pathogen, process it, and display it on an MHC. Unlike the macrophage, these dendritic cells are not there to remove as many of that pathogen as possible. That's what the macrophages are for. Another antigen-presenting cell are the B cells, the B lymphocytes. When we talk about adaptive immunity, you'll see why the B lymphocytes function as an antigen-presenting cell. Before we move on to the next slide, I want to talk about chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is chemically stimulated movement of phagocytes to the site of the injury, or to the location of the pathogens. Essentially, these phagocytes are following a chemical scent trail. And by following this chemical scent trail, you can get these phagocytes in one area to neutralize the pathogens that are there. It's a way to entice them to come to that area where we have the injury, or to that area where we have these pathogens. We'll talk about chemotaxis the further we go in this presentation 
and as well as in the discussion of adaptive immunity. So let's now consider a pathogen that is coated with an opsonin and one that isn't coated with an opsonin. Remember, the whole point of opsonization is to increase the likelihood of phagocytosis. It makes it more likely to occur. So in our first situation here, we have a pathogen where it is not coated with opsonins. Opsonins being either antibodies or immunoglobulins, such as IgG or IgM, or a complement protein C3b. So this pathogen is not coated with an opsonin. Here's the phagocyte. So for example, a macrophage will consume this pathogen whole. Upon ingestion, we now have a phagosome. The lysosome, an organelle which contains digestive enzymes, will fuse with a phagosome, forming a phagolysosome. And now that the pathogen has been digested by the digestive enzymes found within the lysosome, some of that digested pathogen will be exocytosed, and a little piece of that pathogen will be processed and displayed on a major histocompatibility complex. Let's now look at scenario number two, where a bacterium is coated with opsonins. Now, when it comes to bacteria that are enclosed with a capsule, and having this external capsule will decrease the likelihood of phagocytosis. So what will happen is we have opsonins that will coat the capsule, thereby making it likely that the phagocyte, such as the macrophage, will consume it. And what we see is opsonization. So we have antibodies here that will coat the encapsulated bacteria so now the macrophage can see it and will consume it. So if we follow the pathway, the same thing will happen to that pathogen upon ingestion. It will become a phagosome, then it will fuse with a lysosome, becoming a phagolysosome, and eventually excess debris from that digested pathogen will be exocytosed. And of course, a little bit of it will be displayed on an MHC. So whether or not the pathogen has been coated with opsonins, the antigen presenting cell is displaying a little bit of that process antigen once again on a major histocompatibility complex.